Hello and welcome to Access Chat. I'm delighted that we're joined by not but one but two guests today. So we've got Kate Sonka, who is the Executive Director of Teach Access, and Larry Goldberg from Verizon Media, who is one of the founders of Teach Access and has been in the accessibility game since I wasn't able to grow a beard. Um, so uh, welcome to both of you. It's great to have you here. Teach Access has been um, going for a couple of years now, but please tell um, the Access chat crew a, a bit more about who you are and what you're doing with Teach Access. Kate and I are like a tag team whenever we yes. talk to people about this, so uh, we can speak uh, uh, with one brain. Why don't you go ahead and start, Kate? Sure. Uh, thanks so much for having us. We're really excited to be here with you and talk about um, the work that Teach Access has done and is doing. Um, so I've been involved with the organization for um, almost the entire time um, since the kickoff meeting. And, and I can let Larry um, share a little bit about uh, kind of the origin story of it. But um, I work as the executive director um, for Teach Access. Um, and then I also work um, as the Assistant Director of Academic Technology at Michigan State University. So um, it's great to have um, that connection to um, university uh, life and space as we, as we think about the projects we're doing in Teach Access. So um, we can come back to that and talk a little bit more, but um, I'll turn it over to Larry to introduce himself and um, maybe give the origin story. Yeah, it, it is a great origin story. So I'm a head of accessibility for Verizon Media, which is the uh, division of Verizon that was formed uh, when Verizon acquired Yahoo and AOL. And that team of people has had a long history in the field of accessibility. Um, where this really started was at the quite famous CSUN conference. This is now probably five years ago, where a number of us, in particular, my former boss, Mike Shabanek, was sitting down with Jeff Whelan, head of accessibility. Well, former head of accessibility for Facebook, and they were both talking about new hires and what happens when we onboard new people and how unfortunately little new hires know about building accessible products. And as we began talking to various friends in the industry, we realized everyone's feeling this pain. Um, as much as all the major tech companies have dedicated staffs on accessibility, we also have a huge uh, number of colleagues who know nothing about it. So in talking about that, and then Mike handed it off to me, uh, we realized we needed to reach out to higher ed because where else should these uh, new hires be acquiring this knowledge? Well, yes, maybe uh, kindergarten, maybe K-12, but let's focus on higher ed. We have a lot of really good friends throughout universities uh, throughout the US and then in Canada and England and throughout the EU. Um, and one of our very first uh, partners that we had known was Kate at Michigan State that had a very active program and dedication to accessibility. And this kickoff meeting that Kate uh, mentioned was in our lab in Sunnyvale, uh, probably now four years ago, 2016? Yeah, 2016. And That's we began laying out the battle plan. Um, and one of the first things that happened was we began reaching out to our friends across the tech sector, and it was unanimous. It was, as Jenny Lay Fleury from Microsoft said, I am in violent agreement, but of course with her beautiful British accent. Um, and along with Jenny at Microsoft, we had uh, eventually, uh, I try to do it alphabetically, Adobe, Apple, Facebook, Google, Intuit, Microsoft, uh, Verizon Media, Yahoo, Walmart, um, just so many big companies said, we have to do this. We need to build a skill set of our incoming staff. And we started reaching out to universities. And a lot of universities said, oh, we would love to be part of this wonderful tech community. Um, we'd love to find opportunities for our students. And uh, it all began growing from there, uh, forming uh, originally just pure volunteer effort. And then with some really wonderful project coordination help, from the Partnership on Employment and Accessible Technology, a Department of Labor funded grant program. And Department of Labor said, this absolutely meets our needs. Here, have some resources. No contract, no agreement, just here's some resources. And uh, there we began to get a lot more organized. 
And then of course our big breakthrough was the ability to hire Kate and to keep us all organized and rational and focused. At every year we've had strategic planning meetings uh, at the end of every year, come up with a list of, of ventures we want to take on in the coming year. And it's been amazing. So you know, I'll ask Kate uh, to talk about two of the biggest things that we think have a great impact is the uh, Teach Access Study Away program and then the faculty grants. And we'll have some news to share, I think, right, uh, right now. Yeah, thanks. Um, so we do a variety of things um, across, across the group um, and we're divided into task forces to kind of tackle some of these projects. Um, and we can speak more about other projects, but I do think Larry's right in highlighting the um, study way and the faculty grants as the kind of um, most impactful projects we've seen to date. Um, so, sorry, my cat just ran in front of me. Sorry, everybody. Um, so study away, the study away program, um, very unfortunately, we had to cancel it this year, of course, because um, travel uh, was restricted for all of our university partners and, and everybody. Um, but it would have been our third run of this program. Um, so essentially, if you can think about something like a study away program or students are going to a location, they're in the moment learning um, in an experiential way. Um, that's what we're doing with Study Away. So I had um, had the experience of running some Study Away programs at Michigan State University. Um, and so I kind of had an idea that it could work for us, but obviously then it required um, a lot of collaboration across other universities and all of our companies um, as hosts. But um, essentially, a few, um, anywhere from four to six universities that are members of um, Teach Access uh, select a small number of students. Um, so in total across that, we maybe have around 25, no more than 30 students um, who all travel to Silicon Valley um, for the same week. Uh, and then each day, uh, students from all of these universities plus you know, faculty um, who are accompanying them um, move through each of the different companies who've offered to host. Um, some days we spend an entire day at one location, like the days, um, for example, that we go to Verizon Media, we're there all day because there's a lot to see, a lot to learn. Um, some of the other companies either can't host for the whole day or, or we want to try and fit a few more in there. Um, but we take students to these locations, um, they get to meet um, for example, Larry uh, at Verizon Media and his team, um, or any of the other accessibility teams, um, they get to see the location where this work happens, ask questions. Um, really, it's left up to the company who's hosting that day in terms of, you know, what projects do you want to highlight? Who might you want to bring in? <clears throat> excuse me, in the past, for example, um, Larry and his, oh, excuse me, <clears throat> Larry and his team have brought in, for example, internship recruiters or intern, yeah, uh, or, you know, HR type people to answer questions like that. Um, students are put into um, cross institutional groups um, so that they're working with their peers from other institutions um, on a project of some sort. So we give them um, a, <clears throat> excuse me, a design challenge uh, or um, ask them to think about a, you know, a, a kind of a problem and how might they um, uh, answer that. And they spend the week working on that together. Um, and then on Friday afternoon, uh, usually Facebook hosts on Friday. And so we see their stuff in the morning, their, their location. Um, and then in the afternoon, students present the work that they've done uh, within their groups. Um, and it's not necessarily a pitch competition in the sense that companies are um, ready to shell over you know, money to, to make these things happen. But the, the companies are very generous in providing feedback. Um, and so this is for our students just an incredible opportunity because they've thought about something for a week with peers, um, maybe from different disciplinary backgrounds. You know, we might have a computer scientist with um, a UX designer with a journalist, uh, journalism major, um, and they're getting feedback from these industry experts in, hey, that's interesting. Maybe you could think about this. Um, so just a super educational experience for students. Um, out of it, there's no guarantee that if a student goes, of course, that there's any sort of internship guarantee or employment, uh, employment guarantee, but it's happened. Um, there have been students who've secured both an internship and or work um, or jobs uh, with the host companies uh, who've hosted that week and or 
um, just the knowledge that they gain um, helps them as they pursue other educational or other employment opportunities. Um, and I have students who've gone with me the last two years that will keep me posted um, as they graduate. Um, and I just had a student the other day say uh, he was hired as an accessibility con um, consultant for a company um, in Michigan and was really excited. And, you know, a lot of that came from his exposure to um, accessibility uh, through this program. Um, so that one is a great one. We were very sad that um, we had to cancel it this year, but uh, we'll be back next year. Um, and then the other program that Larry mentioned is our faculty grants, um, faculty stipends. So the idea here, um, like Larry said, uh, in thinking about the mission of Teach Action, teach access, which is to infuse accessibility into the curriculum. Um, we're providing um, small-ish stipends, um, $5,000, to um, faculty to create curricular materials that can be used in courses they're already teaching. Um, so we're not necessarily, at least with this round two, um, that's about to be open for applications next week, um, uh, we're not necessarily looking for people to create an entire course that's just accessibility focused. What we really want is a true infusion of accessibility across the curriculum. Um, so we're looking for faculty who are teaching, you know, whatever course it might be, how can you think about infusing accessibility into what you're already doing? Um, one thing that's challenging about, you know, the idea of could you just create a whole course um, is that curriculum is usually so locked down um, and the process to add a new course generally means um, in academia, another course has to be taken away um, or something to that effect. And, and we totally understand that. Um, and so we look at how can you maybe add a module uh, on accessibility that wasn't there before? Could you maybe spend a week on it where, where you have uh, a little bit of wiggle room? Um, and so we've run the program once um, and we had 19 faculty participants or, or recipients, I should say, um, and we learned a great deal. Um, we have some data around um, how they did in terms of infusing that and what that looks like. Um, and we're really excited for this next round to, to continue building on that. Okay, so I know we have a few questions. I, I think Antonio is going to go first and then Neil has some comments. So, and then I can go afterwards. So Antonio. Okay, so, uh, thank you, Deborah. So, uh, Kate, you mentioned you have a, a, a Larry, you have a, you are managing a set of partners, public, private, academia, large or large organizations. Uh, what I would like to know, I know, um, so everyone is learning how to manage. There's always something new coming from this. So, if you if you if you look back, what are the main lessons that uh, you have been taken uh, of this experience? Uh, overdoing it, and particular, I'm particularly in, interested in how is the university benefiting from connecting with the industry? How is this helping them to improve what they do and deliver to the student? Yeah, I think um, because we listened so carefully to the universities in terms of how we shaped this whole program, uh, we had to ask and did a lot of research around um, what would benefit you and what are you going to get out of this? You know, it started off from the very beginning of uh, these universities, particularly in the US are very competitive. They're competitive for getting good students in, they're competitive for getting their students good jobs. And for the universities to be able to have such a tight relationship with the leading tech companies globally is a huge lift. And it starts right off with that. Uh, they're always looking for these relationships uh, so uh, there is that benefit. Also, universities are under a lot of pressure to not only make their own courseware accessible, but to boost this issue of when you talk about a disabled and uh, rather a diverse population of students, make sure you include students with disabilities. So with both the form and the content issues arising, the universities can benefit from just knowing more about the whole issue around accessible design and development. And it can absolutely lead to more opportunities for grants for them, like these faculty grants. Publishing, universities love to publish, their faculty does. And it's a heightened profile across the board. Uh, I think it really is a cutting edge. If you think back to 10 years ago, uh, when mobile technology was just coming out and 
universities weren't really teaching how to design for mobile. And those universities that did get out ahead of the curve really did benefit. They became the centers of excellence. And we think that having accessible technology teaching helps a university become a center of excellence in the field. So, I mean, I'd like, like to agree violently with that. Um, so we'll, we'll continue the, 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 the violence metaphor. <laughs> um, uh, from, from my side, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm doing quite a lot of work with uh, universities in, in, in the UK. Um, sat with, with one hat on and they are interested in all of the things you mentioned uh, in terms of attracting uh, industry partners, making sure that they're competitive and that they are looking to teach the skills that industry want and, and trying to align that. Um, we're also involved in apprenticeships in the in the UK. So apprenticeships are um, not what you would traditionally think of as teaching someone to make a wooden cabinet. These are modern apprenticeships and, and there are various different levels of technical education going right the way up to PhD. Um, so there are various different levels, but, but um, as a group of businesses in the UK, we also identified the need for accessibility skills and went down the apprenticeship route because that's where the money is uh in, in the uk and um we've just had a long process of putting together a, a national apprenticeship standard for accessibility which has uh been accepted now by our department for education so it's going to be a, a nationally recognized occupation which i think is was the strategic aim behind it for me was because i wanted it to become a recognized occupation because then when something is recognized by the Department for Education and the government, then universities start to build courses around it. So, so we've come at it from slightly different ends. You know, almost we started at the same point and went around the different parts of the circle and are ending up in similar places. Um, but what we've done is we've defined the knowledge, skills and behaviors that someone doing the stuff that we need to do will, will need to have in order to deliver the needs for for businesses and we've tried to do this in a way that is um, both suitable for large businesses but also micro businesses so we're really interested to, to, to see what you're doing with teach access because if the universities are creating modules they may be things that um, can plug in to, to the stuff that, 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 that we're doing in the UK because I don't want it to stay in the UK tech is a has a global reach a global span um and, and what we're now trying to do is line stuff up with sophia which is not a lady it's the skills framework for the uh for the information age which is a set of uh you know job descriptors and and so on which is fairly well um adopted around the world and that means that then we do this you should be able to lift and shift the job descriptions and the role descriptions and the knowledge and skills and behaviors and map them to all of your national standards wherever you are around the world so hopefully we'll end up with something that's understood um, and replicable so um, because what we're seeing is there are not enough people out there with the skills that we need to meet the need to make stuff accessible because as you rightly said larry um, there's a few people in each of these tech companies that are specialists, but there's thousands of people making products from technology. Um, so, so where do you see the challenges of scaling? Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. Just like with, st with study away where we have 25 to 30 students, which means we only have another 6 million to reach in the United States. Um, we've had scaling as sort of our number one uh, challenge. For a number of years. Uh, certainly any of the universities that receive grant funds are required to share their course modules. Um, and uh, we try to make everything we do totally open source and transparent. Uh, so the real issue is both in terms of scaling over to the UK and Canada and the rest of the EU. Uh, we, uh, we're basically putting that as a, uh, a longer term goal. Uh, it's interesting. We have so much interest from uh, the UK. 
uh, last uh, November when we were at the TechShare Pro Conference in London, uh, so many people wanted to talk about Teach Access. And uh, you probably know Professor Sarah Luthwaite from Southampton, who has a major grant study exactly on this issue, how to teach about accessibility. So the folks there, both in industry and academia, approached us and we basically said, uh, perhaps the best way to do it is in essence franchise the idea of teach access because for the U.S. to try to drive how it's adopted in England uh, would not be appropriate or effective. So we're much more interested in having folks over there actually pick up the baton and set up their own version with share resources, uh, information, PR, awareness. But we really are looking for local entities to try to take it within their own environment. And uh, that'll help scale it in, in countries all over the world. We, we, we were lucky to have Sarah on uh, with her partner uh, in, you know, in research, Ang Harrod, only a couple of months back. So yeah. yeah, we're aware of what they're doing and want to uh, work with them. Deborah, I know you have a question. Well, Larry actually just answered uh, my question, but I will say that um, what, one, so, but, but one thing I'm wondering is, um, who else are you partnering with in the United States, for example? Because I know there's other um, other organizations. You have IAAP. You have you know other efforts being made. Are you partnering with them to share resources, to gather resources, to you know to make sure that you know as many students as possible will benefit from these efforts? Um, my other question you answered. Um, Larry, I was just wondering what we're, how we're going to take this outside the U.S., but you answered that very eloquently. But I'm just wondering how, who else is being involved to make sure that you have as big of an impact as possible? Well, the first or, thing we should mention... Kate, or, sorry, go, yeah. go ahead. Well, sorry. I was going to say, the first thing we should mention is we, of course, started with partnering with uh, advocacy organizations for people with disabilities. That's the point of this whole thing. So we've always had great support, enthusiastic support, uh, from the major advocacy organizations in such ways as if a professor wants to do a lecture, well, let's go to the local ACB affiliate and find a power user of JAWS and demonstrate to the class what it's like to surf a website that is designed accessibly and one that isn't. So those grassroots connections among the disability community are key and really need to be mentioned right off the bat. Um, with uh, IAAP, well, we actually have a wonderful partner in Nobility out of Texas, mm -hmm. and they are just perfect in terms of their knowledge base, their ability to do outreach, their training, uh, and they've been dedicated to the uh, part of the executive committee now. Uh, with IAAP, it was really interesting because um, what we see their mandate is to create experts in the field, sort of a vertical uh, learning model. And our interest was to go horizontal so that we want everyone to know at least a little bit while IWP is trying to get a few people to know everything. And so where those lines cross is where we have a nice relationship. And we've been talking with Axel and others um, uh, at IWP for quite a while. So we share resources. Um, we consider them a member of Teach Access. Uh, and we're just looking at ways where we can uh, meet each of our goals because, as I said, we don't expect the students who become part of Teach Access to be able to be a full time expert in accessibility with no further training. But we'd like them to have at least once turned voiceover on on their phone as a, <laughs> like a kind of bare minimum, and let's build from there. Which, which yeah, I think, think, yeah, what we always tell students or um, who especially go through things like the study away is that. Um, you might come out of this and not want to have accessibility as part of your title or a regular part of your job. Um, but what I always say to them is once you know it, you can't unknow it. Um, and so now you all know that this exists, that this is a consideration that you have to include from the beginning. And so at the very least, they come out our goal with whether they attend study away or it's working through faculty grants or we've talked about um, setting up uh, student ambassador clubs at um, universities. Um, is know that this is a thing you should know about, um, know where you could get some resources, uh, and also know 
if you get to a place where you realize it's maybe outside of your knowledge base, know that there are people who are the experts who've maybe gone through IWP or, you know, are on Larry's team and reach out to them at that point. Um, rather than you, you have an entire product built ready to ship and then, oh, I never thought about it at all. Um, and so that's really where we continue to come back to is that we're looking at how do we get um, every undergrad student to at least know what accessibility is, you know, to, to be able to define it um, or go to places um, to get their own information if they have questions. Um, so that's, that's really kind of the, I think Larry did a great job of illustrating kind of different focuses that, that different groups have, but. Yeah, and I, I think I'll bring up some really good points. And I like the way you explained, Larry, about IAAP, because they are focused on certifications. And even certifying people doesn't mean they know everything. I mean, it's it's a huge field, but I love the point you made, Kate, that maybe we could get out of college and it, have been exposed to accessibility. But uh, the, the uh, follow-up question I would have would be, so how can how how can others support y'all? I mean, do are you letting um, are you looking for other corporations to join your efforts? Other universities? I was just curious. You know, you know how can others help with what you're trying to do because it's just so critical uh, the you know work you're doing. Great question. Um, so we have a, a website teachaccess.org um, that has a lot of information more about membership and 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 the members that we do have or, or sponsors that we have. Um, so that is a place to go for more information. Um, but really, we we are looking for as many people who want to join uh, to come on in. Um, and so like Larry mentioned, it's other than essentially myself, it's it's voluntary. It's people um, volunteering, we ask or estimate about four hours a month um, between membership, you know, kind of all calls, if you will, uh, meetings, but also um, doing work within a task force. Um, and so, for example, if you're in the company's task force right now, they're doing incredible work on an accessibility um, hiring toolkit. And so they've been thinking about some common job, um, uh, what sort I'm looking for, job postings, I guess, um, for, you know, very standard sorts of entry level jobs. Um, you know, uh, a back-end developer or whatever it might be. Um, and they've identified, you know, three or four bullet points that could be added to a job description that HR could add to the job description to say, um, if you're, you know, graphic designer position open, um, here's all the skills we need. Oh, and here's a three, you know, three or four uh, bullet points about accessibility, um, you know, whatever it might be. So um, that's an area that I, you know, as someone coming from academia, I can't, I can't help with that piece, but definitely the companies can. Um, and that is part of this whole sort of life cycle, right? Because then um, as companies like Verizon Media, for example, starts to incorporate these into their job postings, and then we have students graduating um, or looking for internships, and they're seeing these things appear on these job descriptions from the companies um, that they're trying to uh, secure employment with, you know, that it kind of feeds into the cycle of then they come back and they say, hey, university or college, um, I need to learn about this. And how do I learn about this? And then faculty um, look for materials, which we're helping to create and, and speak to. So um, there's any number of ways that people can definitely um, step in and be involved. Um, I should and, mention, Kate, yeah. because you're, you're always shy of this. Um, the companies <laughs> are the ones who are funding this. So if a company yes. wants to join, we ask for what we would consider a modest donation to keep us going. We'd like to increase our staff fivefold, so we need some additional funds for that. And then uh, universities, we never ask for any funding from. We ask for commitment, commitment to take on this work within their university. And that's what it means to be a member, and that information is on the website. Excellent. Um, so I, I have a question. First, I, I have to actually thank all of the people out there that uh, make Quadruple A products. We know about WCAG and AAA, but you know, quadruple A products are what keep people like Larry and me in a job. That's accessibility as an afterthought. Um, because um, yeah, this is this is essentially what we're we're trying to get away from. But when you yeah, know it won't be in my lifetime. Um, so because because of the scale. But I I I'm really interested in the job description stuff because I think that that um, whilst I am trying to grow the skills for 
expertise, there are elements that are role based and that everybody has some kind of part of their job that, that their remit touches on accessibility, their remit requires them to do these things to make sure that people are included and and the more that we can create ecosystems that uh, that demand this that, that it's a requirement so we're you know within our own organization we're looking at at all of our procurement stuff we're looking at at all of the various different levers through our supply chain through our partners because you've got to push in lots of different directions at once to to, to sort of move the dial because as a an organization on your own you can only affect what you're doing so so what we're trying to do is is have the effect the ripple effect out onto the other company so what you're doing in terms of job descriptions and influencing back into the universities is is, is super interesting because you're you're starting to change people's mindsets about what what the skills are that are needed so uh f for example you know what are what are some of the key things that you're you're listing um, for you know like a front end developer? If, if, what are the three bullet points and as opposed to uh, a UX designer because they're you know they're, they're, they're different they're different skill sets. Do you do you already have them up on the website? I do, yeah, and I um, some of you know for some of the things they overlap, right? Um, there might be bullet points you see, and I, I'm going to drop the link in the chat, but perhaps this could come up, um, or you'd be able to share it out with with anybody. But if you go to teachaccess.org, and you navigate to resources, there's a list there, and the very top bullet point is called the Accessibility Skills Hiring Toolkit. We have it as an option to view as HTML or downloading as a PDF. Um, right now, it's a really long um, page. We are in the process right this moment of also redesigning the website. Um, we anticipate that the, the refresh will come um, in the next couple weeks, so it might look different um, if you go to this later, but um, it is already up on the site under resources. Um, and so you can see, uh, for example, the types of um, positions that are up there around product owner, manager, um, different types of developers, um, QA testers. Um, there's also uh, a list of roles that will be coming in the future. So maybe content editor, publisher, social media um, uh, manager, those sorts of things. But um, this gives you a, a view of um, the types of things that uh, our company's task force has put together. Um, if that, that should help. And we should give a shout out to, to um... Oracle, who's really been one of the leaders in getting this document put together. Yes, and Wonderful as well partner. as um, Pass Yellow Group. Yes, yeah, Sarah Horton has been uh, instrumental in it as well. Um, yeah. So uh, since since the moment that you start to engage with companies and things start to happen, have you observed any changes in the way our, org our companies organize themselves in terms of accessibility teams? We know that sometimes the accessibility team is two, three or four people uh, working on their own, trying to do their best within the space of the organization, or sometimes it doesn't, is not holded by anyone, it's just developers who have that expertise who are basically called to go to fight or to go to, uh, to fight any fires that are in-house. How do you, have you observed any change in the way our organizations are now practicing accessibility in-house? Yeah, um, every one of our companies uh, reorgs on a regular basis, like almost quarterly. So it's just constant change. Um, and I wouldn't say that there's any one particular best way. Um, Microsoft, for instance, had a very centralized and then a decentralized and then a centralized way. Um, having embedded subject matter experts within all product groups is a very good way to look at it. Uh, we ourselves are moving towards having both a centralized hub of expertise, but having subject matter experts in the product groups and in marketing um, and sort of a hub and spoke kind of uh, organization. But uh, every company is organized differently and uh, how big you are, how small you are. Um, I think maybe centralized with only expertise, expertise resident in one small department, it's probably not gonna be the most effective. Um, so I, I think we're looking at, uh, I think even like at Facebook, they may have, oh, let's say 
15 to 20 of these really dedicated experts, but throughout the entire company are people who, when you need to reach out to um, Messenger or Instagram, there are people embedded in those groups who you can go to for improvement of product, improvement of service. So I, I think that combination of centralized and decentralized is what's really, that hybrid is what's working. I, I tend to agree. I think that um, that hub and smoke model is is really sort of what works. You, you, you need some expertise at the center, some um, central source of truth, if you like, about the, the core of what it, what accessibility means for your organization. But then in large companies, and, and you're right, we do reorganize all the time. I like to joke that every time I go on holiday, I find myself in a different bit of the company when I come back. Um, that essentially um, their experience of life, what they're doing, is very different. So then you need that specific knowledge that so 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 you know that core of of, of at the center is useful, but they don't know enough about the product. So. So, so then you need that kind of subject matter on the product as well, because, you know, um, Messenger is very different from um, Instagram, which is very different from, well, not that different from WhatsApp, different audience maybe. Um, but, but again, under the hood, different stuff, different, different ways of delivery, even within large companies, you've got different cultures. Uh, especially ones where you've grown through acquisition as you have experienced yourself, you know, you're the, you, you've come from Yahoo, you, you've got the AOL culture, you've got the Verizon culture, you know, they don't disappear overnight, right? Yeah. There are still different ways of working. So having those people embedded in those different areas of the company is really, really useful, but there has to be, I think, and I think that, you know, you're right, uh, you know, the BBC are doing it this way, we're doing it that way, you know, that mixture of some at the centre uh, and, and, you know, some, some real champions in the product groups works pretty well. Well, you, um, you just used the word I wanted to just spend a minute on, and that is champions. Yeah. We are very now focused on sustainability and that we cannot attach the driving force behind accessibility to an individual who just happens to embrace the subject matter. Um, and we've awarded our champions every year, we recognize them, but champion sounds like something that you volunteer for. And we're moving towards, no, this is your job. You need to be a subject matter expert and you do a good job or you don't do a good job. But uh, I, I really wanna move away from this issue of, oh, I feel empathy for the issue, so I'll dedicate some extra time. It's like, no. It, it, there are certain people have to be designated. This is their job. Um, and they'll be evaluated based on that. Yeah. And I know as much as we love to applaud the people who are putting their heart and soul into this, um, they've got to put their sweat into it as well. No, I, and, and I, I do, uh, semantics aside, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree with you. Uh, you know, I, I think champions can be read in the way that you've just mentioned it in that it's, you know, it's an addendum rather than the sole focus. And I think that we need both. We need people that are dedicated, that are knowledgeable, that are knowledgeable both about the product and about, you know, and responsible because champions don't have to be responsible. Right. And I think there's that, that, that whole thing about actually having this responsibility and accountability and knowledge together is where we start to have that success within, within organizations. Uh, and that's how we get, the the maturity and as you say sustainability difficult word to use at the moment because that's flavor of the month on a whole different tack um especially you know with lots of companies announcing their carbon uh, you know reduction initiatives but it, yeah in in the old sense of the word yes we have to keep this going um it has to yeah. live beyond what, what we're calling it is just simply operational excellence yeah. Uh, and that is, um, this is how you do your job properly. Um, and whoever gets that job next, that's part of their job. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we, we were looking at, at it as quality. Um, so, so accessibility failings are just quality failings. Yeah. It's, like, yeah. It, yeah, it's not good quality. So, uh, yeah, same, same kind of approach. Um, so, we've only got a couple of minutes left, and I know that, that everyone's got a hard stop. 
Uh, before um, we go, are there any things that you want to highlight to us about what Teach Access is doing? Any exciting things, any virtual events, given that everything's virtual at the moment, that you want us to, to flag? And we should mention GAD, um, yeah. Global Accessibility Awareness Day coming up. Yes. Um, yeah, so yeah. Um, we will have, um, not necessarily in a competition sort of way, but um, Larry and his team um, at Verizon Media created some really great accessibility trivia. Um, and so we're looking at how can we roll that out on GAD um, just for fun. Uh, maybe, you know, uh, we're looking at how do we um, maybe have people tag themselves playing trivia and then we can send out a Teach Access t-shirt or something to that effect. So um, stay tuned for information on that. Um, but definitely the, the faculty grants round two um, are opening up um, next week. And I don't have the date in, off the top of my head, um, but it will be up on the site. Um, information is already up on the site actually about um, the application process in terms of what we're looking for from faculty. Um, at least right now, they're still focused on U.S. institutions. Um, so for our friends who are not part of the U.S., sorry, at this point, uh, we don't have it um, set up for that. But um, we definitely want to highlight if you know of people um, or are willing to boost that um, as, it, as it goes out, that would be great. Um, and yeah, I think um, you're always welcome to um, sign up for our general newsletter. We send it out about once a quarter. Um, that's a way for people to kind of keep an eye on what we're doing and, and be a part of that. Um, and of course, if you're interested in joining, um, we're always happy to talk to you. Um, there's information on the site about that, or you can email info at teachaccess.org. Um, and we can we can explore that. So fantastic. So now I do need to thank the people that keep us sustained. That's Barclays, uh, Barclays Access, uh, Microlink, and, and my clear text you know, who provide us with our quality captions. So um, thank you very much. It's been great having you on. I hope it won't be the last time. I'm really interested and love the work that you're doing. So thank you. Look forward yes. to you joining us on Twitter. Thank you all. Thanks Appreciate for having it. us. Great to be part of your group. Thank you so much.